Record Store Nation. We are back. Rocktober is behind us, and we are into full swing into the holidays. So happy holidays, whatever you celebrate. Uh, whenever you get this, I think, should be getting it around the time of Thanksgiving. So give thanks to you and yours and eat a lot of turkey or ham or vegan options, whatever you're into. Welcome to the Record Store. This is the podcast where we simply grab an album at random. Could be something new, could be something old, could be something very old, could be something relatively new, whatever. Um, from the massive stack over here, I do want to, one of these days I'm going to put up a picture so you can actually see the massive stacks of CDs that are on the wall, as well as the uh, the vinyl that accompanies it. So grab a stack, or grab a CD rather at random, and do a little bit of research on the band or the performer. Um, it could be an album that I've listened to very recently, it could be something I haven't listened to in decades, could honestly be something that I've never listened to because I'm that obsessed with music is that sometimes I'll buy albums and honestly, uh, life happens and you don't actually get to listen to it. So it could actually be an album that I've never even listened to, which that's happened a few times on here in um, doing the record store, which is actually kind of therapeutic for me because it kind of makes me realize like, hey, wow, there's a new album for me because I have had it and I've had it for years on that stack. And I haven't even actually listened to it. So it makes me feel better about my purchases and my obsession, my musical obsession. So anyway, that's the concept. Um, we talk about the performer, uh, what he has meant to me. He, she, band, whatever, has meant to me personally, uh, any personal anecdotes or anything. And today, it happened to be an artist that I consider this guy a legend. I consider this guy has been around for a long time, has been very... Um, influential in music and has been under the radar for many years so it is no none other than john cougar mellencamp uh the album that was pulled is called big daddy uh, i believe it's his 10th album we'll get to that when we get to the notes here so big daddy john cougar mellencamp's 10th album uh john cougar again like you you kind of forget about how many hits this guy has had just tons and tons of hits uh, i believe it was 22 top 40 hits over the years uh, so that is a greatest hits double album, if you ask me. And you forget how many great songs that he's had. The guy was a huge star in the 80s and 90s, I would say. Uh, seemed like he was on his way to becoming another legendary you know, singer-songwriter, performer, like a Tom Petty, Bob Dylan. Uh, but then he seemed to flame out and kind of vanish from the scene after you know, many, many, a string of huge numbers of hits. Uh, very much an Americana type guy, fits in with that petty mold. Bob Seger was another comparison when I was thinking about it. Um, who do you compare John Mellencamp to? That that era, you know, like I said, like Tom Petty, Bob Seger, that kind of that kind of radio airplay kind of guy. Um, huge hits were obviously like Pink Houses, Hurt So Good, Jack and Diane, Small Town. Uh, like I said, 22 top 40 hits. So the guy had 13 Grammy nominations. He won one of them. Um and actually, believe it or not, had an album this year. I bet you didn't know that. Um, this guy, John Mellencamp, had, or John Cooper Mellencamp? I don't know. It varied over the years. We'll get to that. Um, but anyway, so John Mellencamp had an album this year, earlier this year. It's called Strictly a One Eyed Jack. Guy had been working on it for a couple of years, had uh, slowed down because of COVID in terms of the, um, the release of the album. But all said and done, he has sold over 60 million albums worldwide. Uh, John Mellencamp is now 71 years old. I bet he's a tough 71, you know, like a badass kind of 71 year old dude. Um, so he is famously from Seymour, Indiana, got into music and signed at an early age, like just out of high school and college. Um, but they said that Mellencamp was too hard to market and he was told to become Johnny Cougar. Uh, he reluctantly said he would. Um, he was told you sound like a hillbilly, and he said he replied famously, well, I am. Uh, thank you, Munyeka. Um, He was told to basically drop the name Mellencamp or else, the hard German name, I guess, uh, because it was too hard for the record companies to market. So he did indeed go ahead with it, didn't like it, hated it, fought it kicking, kicking and screaming, but he went ahead with it. Um, First couple of albums, he had signed to a label. First couple of albums bombed. He was dropped by the label. Um, eventually... A song called I Need a Lover, which you've probably heard, was became out of left field. This song became a hit in Australia. Seems like the Australians have a real connection with John Mellencamp for some reason. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Pat Benatar discovered I Need a Lover and recorded it, covered it. And that is somehow in a backwards kind of way what got him noticed and got him signed. 
So a couple more albums came out. American Fool was a sixth album that ended up being his breakthrough. That was where t- three of the top 10 hits came out. Uh, he got the Grammy based on this album's work, Best Male Rock Vocal for American Fool. Um, and at that point, you know, after the success that he had there and then with the next couple albums right after that, that was where he felt like he had arrived. So he went back to the name John Mellencamp. So he he was going from it went from Johnny Cougar to John Cougar Mellencamp. And then he eventually dropped Cougar altogether. So I think people know him any number of ways. And I just I can't remember the comedian, but I remember some comedian doing stand up and referred to him as John Camp Cougar Mellon. And for whatever reason, that joke stuck in my head. And I still kind of refer to him whenever I think about him. I think of him as John Camp Cougar Mellon. So he started uh, gradually over the years, he started easing away from rock, more towards folk and bluegrass, hard country. Um, he described his style as a no depression style of music. That's how he coined it. Um, you've been through bad times and you weren't going to let it get you down and you were going to sing about it. So um Guy got very involved in a lot of causes, most famously Farm Aid. Uh, He was one of the founders of Farm Aid in 1985 with Willie Nelson and Neil Young, I believe. Um, And so they've been doing those concerts, I think, annually. I don't know if COVID affected that, but they've done them for many years, raising money for the farmers. So um, he called this album Big Daddy. He called it his best album in retrospect. Looking back, he referred to it as his best album. We'll get to that, what I think of it. Um, but he did also say that about another album that came out later. So I'm not sure if he understands the concept of best. So, um, but it is definitely, he, he put this one and another one at the top of his list of all of his 20 plus albums that he's had over the years. Um, he did not tour on it. He started painting at the time, which eventually painting became his passion. Um, mostly his paintings are very sad looking, representing his views on his disillusionment with music, the music industry and the, the farmer's plight and just the way America was at the time when he started taking up this hobby of painting. So he kind of drifted a little bit from music. He still was very consistent. Um, in the, in the eighties and nineties, he was doing an album about every other year. And then he tapered off to about every two or three years. Um, so he still had quite a few albums, even in the two thousands, he's had a handful of albums for sure. Um, he kept recording, he kept touring, um, he had a heart attack in 1994, a mild heart attack in 94. So that obviously slowed him down a little bit. Um, but in the early 2000s, he started working with more country people, kind of folk, kind of rap, actually, even too. at, at that point. Uh, he just wanted to branch out more. He started getting more into folk and blues, s- continued to kind of slide away from rock a little bit. Um, he just seems like Mellencamp seems like the kind of guy who gets bored gets bored with the status quo um, and always wants to go in a different route and kind of mix things up. So I respect that. You know, he he didn't want to go with the same album over and over and over again. Um, A lot of his hits were similar, I guess, similar kind of songs, like straight ahead rock and roll kind of songs. But I respect the fact that he wanted to change routes and change directions and go different ways with his career. Uh, Went into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2008 Um, Again, like I said, very active politically, very active in many causes. Uh, He's been married three times. Uh, No need to go over his 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 uh, romantic issues and such. But I do want to make mention of kids. He has five kids and three of them are named Justice, Hud and Speck. So I just wanted to make mention of that because they're unique names. So the other two kids, actually, they were the blessed ones. They got kind of the normal names. So I'm just wondering what it is like to live life as Speck Mellencamp. So anyway, he's been drug and alcohol free since college. He decided to get that out of his system and stayed with it. Uh, However, he smoked up to 80 cigarettes a day. So pretty sure that probably contributed to the heart attack. Uh, And hopefully he's gotten his health back in line since then. And hopefully he's cut down on that cigarette habit. Jesus. Um, So, yeah, 24 albums between uh, 1976 and 2022. Uh, This one, Big Daddy, that we're going to cover today is his 10th album, came out in 1989, hit number seven on the Billboard charts, um, and hit number one in Australia. So there we go again. So it's the Australia connection. Uh, There's some unique connection between the Australian audience and John Mellencamp. So uh, he continued, this album continued the social commentary that he started getting into the the album previous to this. Uh, 
So he kind of continued that route. And then ever since then, that's what he's been all about is the social commentary, not the simple sucking on chili dogs kind of lyrics that he used to do way back in the day. Um, this album, Big Daddy, no lyrics, just a very, very spare package. A uh, couple of pictures of the band himself, uh, a couple of his kids at the time, um, but a very simple package and no lyrics. So I had to do a little bit extra work here to find the lyrics on the Internet, which is thankfully that's a that's an achievable thing and easy to find these days. So back in the day, you probably would have had to write a letter to somebody and send it off and get it in the mail a week later, maybe if you're even lucky to hear back from them or it, can you imagine going to the public library? I, I feel like I have to hand sanitize my whole body after being in the public library. <laughs> so, but anyways, the lyrics are achievable. So I got them. Uh, the album runs 42 minutes and let's get started on it. So first song is called Big Daddy of Them All. Obviously something of a title track for the album. Uh, immediately comes in with a bluegrass kind of guitar sound to it. Um, song is about his basically his own womanizing. So it's a very self-deprecating song. Um, his womanizing cost him his marriages. Uh, very spare song, uh, accordion here, some banjo here. Uh, he sings about chasing women. Um, it's a, it's his unmistakable voice, uh, but definitely way more low key than what you may be thinking of with the R-O-C-K and the USA kind of guy. Um, definitely more of a low key kind of singing here. Um, so he's already starting to kind of change his ways a little bit on this 10th album. Um, in terms of toning down the rock a little bit, although we do get to the the inimitable Mellencamp style on some other songs. Um, but this kind of indicates, as the opener to the album, this kind of indicates that it's going a slightly different direction. Um, he uses the word sad and disgusted. So like I said, pretty self-deprecating song, uh, lamenting the fact that he cost himself his second marriage. I think this was when, yeah, this was his second marriage. He was going through the divorce um, at this point when he was doing this album. So good song, uh, Big Daddy of Them All, good song, a uh, little bit different, not kind of what you would expect for an opener, especially, but still a good song. Uh, second song is called To Live. Uh, definitely more of a lively st start to it, uh, like a more of a, a little bit harder country kind of start to it. Uh, it's a pleasant song. The band definitely contributes more here um, than they did on the first song. The first song, definitely more spare, whereas this one has much more of a band feel to it. Um, and great background vocals here. Uh, there's a couple ladies on this album that sing, and I'm going to name them towards the end of the episode, but there's a couple ladies that sing throughout this whole album that just really, it, like, a. I hate to use Tina Turner, but like that kind of vibe, they give it, they give his songs that kind of vibe. It's the closest um, name comparison that I can come up with as far as those background girls that just add so much to the music here, and including this song. Um Seems to be a real simple message with to live, just basically a simple message of if you ever get lost, you need to find yourself and live life to its fullest. So good song at number two, to live. Third song, one of the highlights of the album, it's called Martha Say. Uh, it is, to me, the return of the John Cougar sound here. Uh, very welcome sound here on this song. Not that the first two songs were bad at all. They were good songs, but just different direction, like I'd said. Um, this one seems like a return to his his roots of radio airplay kind of sounds. Um, it actually has very much a Van Halen sound to it. And I know that's a really weird comparison and it may catch you off guard. Like it caught me off guard hearing it again today. Um, it's a rocker and it gets you moving. It totally gets you moving, either moving in your chair, or get off your feet <laughs> and, and move uh, on your feet, I guess, not off your feet. Uh, but move because it's a really good song. Uh, it's about a badass woman named Martha. Uh, she ain't changing for any man at all, but this is basically Mellencamp telling her to watch herself so she doesn't get burned. So it's a great song. Uh, the Van Halen comparison is unmistakable. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just a great combination of that kind of sound with Mellencamp singing. So I, I definitely think uh, a, a winner for sure. Uh, did get some airplay, was released as a single. Uh, I do remember hearing Martha say on the radio, a uh, real good song. So at the number three spot. So, all right, believe it or not, we're at the halfway point of the album and the episode. So we're going to take a break. We're going to pay some sponsors and we'll be right back with side two of Big Daddy by John Mellencamp. John Cougar Mellencamp officially. That's on the name of the album. So side two of Big Daddy coming up next. Stay with us, guys. All right, we are back. Thank you to our sponsors for keeping the lights on and keeping the ramen soup coming. Thank you to Munyeka for always making a cameo appearance. It doesn't seem like I can go through an episode without her 
making an appearance. Uh, she is, I have to begrudgingly admit, the love of my life. So I have to deal with it um, until I install a soundproof recording studio system, whatever, or move into a different apartment or maybe record in the closet. That seems like something that Manson or Jeffrey Dahmer would do or something. But anyway, so you're going to have to deal with Munyeka. Hopefully it's not as uh, disturbing as it is to me as I have to hear it as we record. So anyway, we are on side two of Big Daddy. It's the 10th album by John Cougar Mellencamp. Uh, he does not become John Mellencamp for a few more albums after this. Uh, but we're on side two. It is the self-proclaimed by John Mellencamp himself, his best album. So we'll see. First couple songs have been really good. We're up to the fourth song, uh, and it is called Theo and Weird Henry. Just, you know, reading that title, it just sounds like it's two characters from Fat Albert or something. And I'm I'm sorry if I can... Can I not say Fat Albert? That doesn't seem politically correct these days. And also referencing Bill Cosby. So it's like a double whammy of political incorrectness. So Theo and Weird Henry... Two characters from a, it's that one, the kid who had his face was his hat or his hat was his face or whatever. Was it Mushmouth? I don't remember. But there's some really great characters on Fat Albert. But it's sad that you can't even reference them anymore because, you know, it would be uh, pleasantly plump Albert probably these days. If even plump, I don't know, that's probably not even acceptable either. And just the fact that you're referencing Bill Cosby in the first place. So, although people still say Bill Cosby's stand up, like in the 60s and 70s, was amazing. So, I did like it as a little kid, but I digress. So, anyway, Theo and Weird Henry, the name of the song, um, also comes in with a traditional John Cougar sound, uh, despite the odd title. Uh, it's essentially it's a song about two guys in a band, two friends, just two guys in a small town band. Um, sounded very autobiographical as you're listening to it. So uh, it sounded like he's just going about capturing the moments of these two guys being friends and all the times that they shared as buddies, basically being brothers. Um, eventually it sounds like they moved apart, but always remained really close uh, throughout the years. Uh, another really good song, again, despite the odd title, Theo and Weird Henry, a really good song. Um, I'm starting to believe we're four songs into it. I'm starting to believe what John Cougar said about this album, that it is his best album. So we'll see, we'll see how the rest of it progresses. There's 11 songs or actually technically 12. We'll get to that too. Um, fifth song is called Jackie Brown. My first thought hearing this, and this is a song that also got released, got some airplay. Uh, my first thought hearing the title, or again, seeing the title Jackie Brown was the Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, so I had to look it up to see, did somebody rip off somebody else? But it was, the song was released eight years prior to the Tarantino movie. So there's no connection. Um, I thought at first maybe Tarantino was basing something around this song or maybe use this song as a springboard to kind of create a movie around, but no connection whatsoever. Cause as famously as you recall, Tarantino is my favorite movie maker. So, um, Pam Greer was Jackie Brown in the movie, so obviously a female, whereas in this song, Jackie Brown is a male. So no connection, just a coincidence, uh, and eight years apart. Uh, and actually, I have something interesting about the Van Halen connection that we will talk about in the Patreon, so you got to stay tuned for that. Chip in on that. Um, it, my conspiracy theory comes to light there. Uh, anyway, so in this song, Jackie Brown, Jackie is a male. It's back to the bluegrass sound here. It's just a song, a, a really, uh, really depressing song about poverty, a ballad about poverty. It got some airplay, despite the fact that it was kind of a downer. Um, sad song about the poor living conditions of Jackie and his family, uh, living on barely any food, no running water, you know, that kind of thing. Like, just sounds like a very poor you know, depression era type family in the, in the mountains of West Virginia or somewhere where there's just not, you know, there's just e extreme poverty. So a real downer of a song, but yet a powerful song and a good song nonetheless. So really enjoyed Jackie Brown, despite um, the, the kind of downer message that it brought. But then we pop back up again. Uh, sixth song is called Pop Singer. It was another single. Uh, the line that really sticks out in it to me is never wanted to be no pop singer. Uh, this is where Mellencamp is lashing out at how plastic society has gotten. Uh, it's very heavy on the drums, very heavy in violin. Again, the background, the background singers, the ladies do a really nice job on the song. Um, and despite John Mellencamp not wanting to conform, this song is catchy as hell. Um, it's a great rock meets bluegrass kind of sound to it. So really good. Um, he's pushing really hard that he's very happy being an outsider. He's not, uh, he's not, you know, your typical 
rock star that you know does all the typical rock star things he's very happy on the outside looking in uh very short catchy song pop singer is just to the point and totally works so really good song pop singer got some airplay uh as a single and deserved more because just a really good song so then we go to seven song it's called void in my heart uh again a very reflective song about the second divorce that he was going through at the time this album was being put together um these things about he started as a working man, again, very autobiographical. A lot of this album is uh, I started as a working man, you know, laboring a hand labor kind of guy. Um, then he finds himself singing for millions of people. He graduated college, has a degree, but now he sits alone, you know, and so he's reflecting on the fact that he's basically screwed up multiple marriages. Number two on this one. Uh, but there are, you know, he, he kind of realizes that there's billions of other. He said billions of other people. I don't know if there's billions, but there's many, many other men that are in his position. And so he doesn't seem, he, he seems like he's okay with it. And he knows that he will come out of it. Um, he'll snap out of it eventually, he hopes, basically. So Void in My Heart, uh, another deep reflective song about how he is effed up his, uh, his love life. So, all right. Eighth song is called Mansions in Heaven. Um, a very pleasant song, again, goes kind of back to the old John Cougar sound here. It's a humble man persona reflecting on life. Um, he, the simple message seems to be it's not about winning or losing, but it's about participating in life. Uh, simple song, not much to say about it. The message is very clear. Um, I enjoyed it. Good song. Uh, Mansions in Heaven at number eight. Ninth song is called Sometimes a Great Notion. Uh, comes in hard, like a hard rocking song. So the best comparison I can make here is Charlie Daniels Band. Uh, just a lot of fiddle and just that hard rock rock meets country kind of vibe to it it starts out really strong so sounds like basically he's singing as a tough guy who's been hardened by hard times in his life and he's celebrating essentially celebrating the man that it's made him so he again pretty self self autobiographical i would say uh because it seems like between just all the stuff that he went through between the name change and the way the record out or the uh, record companies treated him and so on it just seems like nothing can rattle this guy um, no matter what life throws at him, he's going to come out on top. So there was a sometimes a great notion has a violin solo, an electric violin solo, which I thought added a lot to the song. And it also, like I said, kind of brought home that Charlie Daniels kind of feel to it. Um, you would think in most songs, you know, you get the guitar solo, but in this song, you get the violin solo. So I think it's a real catchy song uh, and a really nice combination, a real cro good cross between rock and country on this one. So really enjoyed Sometimes a Great Notion. Uh, tenth song, another one of the highlights of the album, it's called Country Gentleman. Uh, and it becomes very clear when you hear Country Gentleman or you see that title and you know that he's from a hick town in Indiana, you kind of maybe think that he's, again, singing about himself or singing about somebody that he's close to. Uh, but it turns out that Country Gentleman is, believe it or not, about Ronald Reagan, uh, who was president back in the day at the time. Uh, it has kind of a Neil Young start to it, very acoustic start, but then it kicks in. Um, and Mellencamp is thinking about how he ain't going to help the poor man. He's only going to help his rich friends. Um, so Reagan is, believe it or not, Reagan is the country gentleman that he's talking about, which the whole thing is a facade and it's an act and he's not going to do anything to help anybody except his friends. According to Mellencamp, uh, we're not going to get political here because we know that that's opening up a whole can of worms, uh, but definitely a powerful song. Uh, and it's from I think it's so interesting because it's sung from the perspective of a guy who has done a ton of charity work and has helped a ton of people, whether it's the farmers or other groups that he's worked for. So I think it's really interesting hearing a John Mellencamp sing, you know, negatively about a politician who was in power at the time. So I, I really enjoyed the perspective here. Uh, the last line is, thank God he went back to California. That really drives it home that it's about Ronald Reagan. So another really good song, Country Gentleman, it's the 10th song. And then what is supposedly the last song on the album is the 11th song. It's called JM's Question. JM, obviously John Mellencamp. Uh, JM's Question seems to be um, just kind of a catch-all closer to the album. Uh, to, it's a deep and reflective album, and it seems like here he just goes about calling out all the other issues that he couldn't get to on these other songs. So there's he talks about the ozone, causes for cancer, bad education in the country, gun violence, war, the rainforests. Uh, one of the key lines that he says over and over is, what kind of world do we live in? 
Um, it's a spare song. I've used that word a couple times on this episode, but it's a spare song, kind of rocking. But it is kind of rocking, and it's kind of um, kind of reminded me of like an Exile on Main Street Stones era, like a '70s era Stones vibe to this song. So again, those Tina Turner-ish girls. Uh, I looked up the names: Pat Peterson and Georgia Jones are the two singers on here. Uh, that do great work throughout the whole album. And again, great work on this song too. Uh, but JM's question, like I said, kind of felt like, you know, these are all the other topics and issues that I wish I had time to, you know, maybe make this a double album and see it, sing an entire song about war or an entire song about the ozone layer. Uh, but because he couldn't get in more material on here, and he always talks about, he's got dozens and dozens of songs that are just sitting in his catalog that he hasn't recorded yet. So this is a guy who's, very prolific and has written a ton of stuff. And that explains why he's had 24 albums over the years, because the guy just keeps on writing. So even at this late stage in his career, he still has, I'm sure books and books of the lyrics that he hasn't released yet. Um, so enjoyable song, you know, great work throughout, like I said, great work from these ladies throughout the album uh, and a great album, you know, so I'm going into it thinking this is the last song. It's the last song that's listed on the back of the album. And lo and behold, another song comes on. There's a 12th song unannounced. It's not listed on the credits, not listed on the back of the album. It's called Let It All Hang Out. Um, a very um, underground kind of cover, I guess. The name of the band was The Ombres. Uh, it's just a fun cover. It's a fun kind of late 60s kind of sound to it, uh, like an animals kind of sound to it, rascals kind of sound to it. Uh, the Ombres, I guess that's why, you know, they're from that same era. So I guess the name makes sense. So just seems like uh, Mellencamp wanted to include a party song to kind of close out a deep and serious album to show that he can still have fun and he can still do songs like he was doing back in the day of the sucking on chili dogs lyrics. So Let It All Hang Out is the 12th and final song on the album uh, that did not get credited, did not get listed on the album, but a fun song nonetheless. Um, I'm kind of torn because I liked ending the ending it with JM's question because that was such a deep and it kind of it kind of tied a bow on the album as far as like the deep and introspective stuff that he sang about on almost every single song on this album. Um, but I'm kind of torn because this actually, like I said, it kind of brings about the fact that you can remember that John Cougar was you know, a lot of fun back in the day and had a lot of cool singles and a lot of, you know, just fun stuff. And so maybe, like I said, I think he just included this here and didn't list it on the album tracks because he wanted to send people home with a smile, you know, after listening to this album. So anyway, in terms of is it his best album, like he said, um, honestly, it's it's excellent. It's very good. You know, there was a number of really great deep songs on this album. Uh, Martha Say is such a good song. Theo and Weird Henry, pop singer itself, uh, country gentleman, just so many good songs on this album. Um, very deep, not exactly what you would expect. You know, when you look back on John Cougar, you think fun stuff. You think, you know, you don't, I mean, you could possibly go the route of the farm aid guy, you know, that, that got so politically involved in things after the nineties uh, or through the nineties into the two thousands. But you may think of John Cougar that way. Um, but I think that excellent career, you know, the guy had just so many different, different facets to his career. Uh, and just really interesting how under the radar the guy has been for the last like 20 years or so. You really haven't heard his name very much. So uh, there have been albums. There have been albums every two, three years. But just again, you know, we talk about it like a broken record, as it were, that there's no um, there's no radio airplay for a guy like that to, to be discovered anymore. Like there was when his first couple handful of albums came out. So John Cougar Mellencamp, uh, Big Daddy, excellent album, highly recommended. Uh, and that is it. That is this episode of The Record Store. So thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you, Record Store Nation. Thank you to Brian for producing, making me sound better than I am. Uh, and thank you to John Mellencamp for being such a great performer, you know, and such a great a guy that I've never seen. Don't really have any stories about him other than that John Camp Cougar Mellon comedian story. Um, but never seen him. Uh, I probably would. Uh, and I think actually this is going to reinvigorate doing this episode is going to reinvigorate my, um, my appreciation of him because there's definitely been probably at least a dozen albums that have come out since this one. And I'm going to go back and look for some of those and see what kind of music he was doing in the, um, in the two thousands, because I have to admit, I have not picked up anything probably since about this album. 
So that is it. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, if you're a Patreon, please stay with us because you are going to get to find out in amidst all these great songs on this album, what was my favorite song on Big Daddy by John Mellencamp. So stay with us. And otherwise, we will see you in a couple of weeks. And don't forget, I have fun everywhere I go. We'll talk to you soon. Rock, 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 record store nation. We'll talk to you soon, guys. Have a great week.